what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like Ron Paul Peel, the godfather of infomercials. This is particularly relevant in this particular interview, the founder of the P90X, RX Bar, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Um, our mission is to connect you with your best referral partners and customers. We do that with a done-for-you podcast service. Uh, in my opinion, podcasting is the best thing that's ever happened to my business and my life. Met my business partner, best friends. I'm able to connect with amazing people and get great content out to the world. We will mention also from Poop to Gold podcast, so you could check that out as well. Um, uh, we also have a done-for-you lead generation service where we manually send consistent flow of customized outreach messages. This is not paid advertising. Um, and also we do a done for you VIP event for large conferences, software companies, or agencies. Um, if any of those sound interesting, you can uh, email us at support at rise25.com. We have limited bandwidth so we uh, because it requires a lot of humans to do the work. So email us and we can talk more. Um, I am especially excited to have today's guest. We have Daniel Harmon, co-founder and creative visionary at Harmon Brothers. Daniel, thanks for, you know, I'm hoping on this we do some kind of drawing on your belly button and it talks. That's really what I'm hoping for in this particular interview. So That was mainly going to be my first question. Okay, okay good. <laughs> Can um, I show my tummy? <laughs> totally. Anything's fair game here. Um, <laughs> They use storytelling and humor and direct response to create social ads that sell products. And they're behind some of the most viral ads and have collectively driven more than 1 billion views, over 300 million in sales, and revolutionized the way products are marketed. You've probably seen some of their ads. Um, they've created internet advertising blockbusters, including Squatty Potty, Purple Mattress, Chatbooks, Fiber Fix, and Poopery, just to name a few. Um, they also have a book that I highly recommend. Um, I've listened to it, believe it or not, you know, two times. Um, yes, okay. maybe in two times speed, but that's fine. That's, that's twice more than I have. Okay, no, cool. <laughs> you lived it. You don't have to listen to it. So. From Poop to Gold, The Marketing Magic of Harmon Brothers. This will give you the behind-the-scenes view of their company, how they create blockbuster ads. Daniel, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me on, Jeremy. Super excited. Um, there's so many good stories and so many uh, really creative things you've done. I have to start with, you know, growing up, you had nine, you're one of nine. Yeah, one of nine siblings. So what's a good story from growing up in, I can't even imagine, first of all, <laughs> a crazy story. A crazy story. Uh, well, we grew up in Idaho, and so it was very rural. My closest late neighbor lived about a quarter mile away, and I grew up that I had the stereotypical Idaho farm boy life in that I grew up working on a potato farm um, with my uncles as well as a family friend and, you know, got up at five o'clock in the morning to change irrigation pipes. Um, you know, it's just basically changing the, a giant sprinkler system on a field. Right. Right. And, um, and ultimately what ended up happening is when you go out and you work and do kind of this blue collar labor, uh, you say to yourself, I want to do something else. <laughs> At least I did, right? As, as, every, every day I'd be at work, I'd be like, I'm going to college. I'm going to college. I'm going to find a way to break through this. But uh, my, my brothers and I, um, we were always kind of uh, entrepreneurial. And what ended up happening is we decided that we were going to sell some potatoes in order to um, make some money. And ultimately, we would buy these potatoes from my uncle's farm, pack them up in these 50 pound boxes and drive them down to Utah, which I'm sure was illegal. But anyway, we, do, we didn't know any better, right? And we'd go down door to door to families in Utah where not all their neighbors were potato farmers and we would sell these potatoes. And um, uh, ultimately we had a lot of success with it and started doing the math and realizing, oh, we're making like twice or maybe even three times what we would be if we were just doing a regular hourly wage job. 
and th this was something that we would do like um, in the winter time uh, when we weren't working on the farm. And we did it in order to earn money for, uh, to pay for um, our mission for our church and to pay for college and those types of things. And that was my kind of my first exposure to sales was going door to door, yeah. knocking on it, being like, hi, does your family eat potatoes? No. Okay. Bye. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know anything else. Um, You're or, qualifying them. That's fine. Oh, yeah, call. oh, you eat rice. Okay. Well, <laughs> let's go to someone else. No, but, um, but it, it was very much like, it was something that most people wanted and it was kind of a, a little bit more of a sob story. Uh, I guess the credibility we would bring into it was, you know, we're doing this to earn money to pay for um, a mission that we're going to serve for our church or to, to pay for college. And that was enough to be like, Oh, it's this 15 year old kid. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just buy the potatoes, $20 for the 50 pound box. And um, that's, that's what we did is just sold potatoes. I think so. You know, going door to door puts hair on the chest for, you know, I think <laughs> some of the best infomercials of all time stem from pitchmen yes. or people who sold door to door. Right. And so yeah. go ahead. Well, I mean, we always say that we learn to sell first in person, face to face, face to face, human to human, long before we ever learn to do it in any kind of social video or online. And so the principles that you find are basically, they're universal, right? Sales principles go back, I mean, probably centuries, but um, for sure, uh, e easily most of the sales principles that we employ have probably been around for, you know, the better part of a century for sure. And we're, we're just um, applying them now to online video. But yeah, I mean, we learned, we, we learned to be salesmen um, long before we learned to be, you know, video creators and ad makers. Yeah. I mean, cause you have to overcome, you know, when you're face to face, you can overcome objections, but when you produce it, you have to know the objections and overcome them before. Right. Yes. So yes. talk a little bit. I want to kind of go back through the evolution because you, did door-to-door -door sales for potatoes. You did security systems. Take yes. us up to the present, but I want to hear about the, um, the process, really, of you creating the ad. But um, potatoes, what was next? Yeah, so the next one was um, we did do um, alarm sales or home security systems. Um, I did it for an ADT-authorized dealer. What's um, the pitch I, for that? Well, the, the pitch for that is essentially... You rob them and then you go to their... <laughs> 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 well, at the time, the pitch was asking them to put an ADT sign in their yard and um, to do advertising in their community to show other people that, you know, this was something that they could put in their home. Um, and that is as long as they qualified with good credit and stuff, we would do an alarm system for free. Um, they would just pay like an installation cost and then, um, and then they would just keep up the monthly monitoring service fee. And th that was basically um, the pitch. And it, what was interesting is during that time was I actually learned that when someone says, oh, I don't want an alarm system, that doesn't actually mean no, right? It, that, that, that's an objection that they're bringing up, but there's something else behind that and mm. how to kind of get to the root of that and overcome that objection and be able to address it and be able to listen to people and not always take no for as for an answer. Right. So, um, kind of learned that skill set as well as kind of being able to take people through sort of a problem uh, solution type of sale. Right. Uh, that was kind of my first exposure to that. Um, and my brother and I, um, uh, Jeffrey, he's a co-founder of Harmer Brothers as well, um, but, but no longer. Um, he's just an advisor now um, here at Harmer Brothers. But we were um, two of the top salesmen in the company wow. um, that year that we joined. Um, our CEO now, um, Benton Crane, was also on our sales team. Really? And he, yes, yeah. And he actually um, um, had a period where he was really knocking it out of the park there. And so we learned this, this kind of sales stuff um, in order just to be able to pay college tuition, you know? And um, ultimately, we ended up. Um, Ultimately, I also had a business where I did window washing, sold that door to door and did the washing of the windows myself. And then I did some business to business sales with um, a tech company that my brother had started and stuff. And so learned all this stuff um, about selling again before I ever like made my first video. Mm. And um, it's, it just provided a really good foundation for us. 
What, were the, what was the, Daniel, what was the real reason people didn't buy? So they said, I don't want an alarm system. What did you find was the real reason? Most, most people would say that they were, uh, they felt secure. Oh, this is a safe neighborhood. That was my, my, one of the main ones. Uh, it, mostly it was like, oh, I don't want to add another bill. It's a monitoring fee. I don't want to be have a recurring monthly bill. You know, forget it. Those were the those are the real main two concerns um, that we had. Kind of people can't come up with, and then there were some bizarre ones from there. But that was that was kind of what it boiled down to. Yeah. Um. So that taking us up to Harmon or the the start of Harmon Brothers. Yeah. You know, your brother Jeff was in a classroom and. The guy from Aura Brush presented. Yeah, so there was this inventor, Dr. Bob, um, and he had invented this product called the Aura Brush, which was a tongue cleaner for bad breath. And um, he actually, um, well, basically he was trying to market this product because he was new as effective. It did remove the gunk on your tongue that causes most of the bad breath. And, but he put it in stores and had, had basically no success with it. And then in a last ditch effort, he goes over to the local university, which is um, Brigham Young University or BYU. My brother's there in a marketing class, just kind of half listening. <laughs> well, he's really more on his computer, like reading TechCrunch and, and, and Mashable and these kind of things. Um, and just reading up about marketing. And um, one of the conclusions that one of the, one of the groups within this marketing class came to when they did this research on the R brush was that, Oh, you know, if you were to sell this online, only 7% of people would buy it. So just don't even bother. That's just not a very high percentage. And then Jeffrey, my brother raises his hand and says, well, wait a minute, 7% of like a, a population of like 300 million, that's still millions of people. Why not right. sell them? And Dr. Bob really loved that response and kind of approached Jeffrey afterwards and said, I want you to market this product for me. And uh, Jeffrey was working at, um, a, a tech company at the time um, and he kind of started doing this on the side and ultimately ended up kind of um, pioneering um, a lot of well he, he put together he and my brother Neil he brought him in as well ended up putting together a lot of what we would now consider a sales funnel right um, where they made a landing page yeah. And um, this offer to get the Aura brush for free, you pay shipping and handling. Just to orient people, I think at the time YouTube was just starting out, or what was the yeah, landscape YouTube, like? YouTube was just starting out, and Jeffrey, yeah. Jeffrey was saying to himself, "Okay, how can we get the conversion rates up on this video or up on this um, landing page?" And he found on YouTube a video that um, tested how you could have, you could where you could test how. You have bad breath, right? You, yeah. Yeah, use a spoon, scrape it on your tongue, smell it, and all that kind of stuff. And he put that, and it didn't have anything to do with Aura Brush, mind you, right? Other than the subject matter, but the, it didn't have any brand of Aura Brush in it. Right. And he put that in on the website, and the conversion rates went up by over 30%. Wow. And he's like, okay, there's something to do this. What if we actually make a video of this ourselves? Right. So he writes up this initial script. He, he recruits his roommates to help um, help shoot and help um, finish writing it and make it really funny. So he gets his roommate, Joel, um, and he gets his roommate, Devin, and um, they make this video. And um, he recruits a guy from his own work uh, that was always ranting, going on political rants, and he was really funny to listen to. Brings him in, and they just go shoot this thing in a pool hall in the middle of the night on a white, you know, just a white wall. And um, kind of basing it off of that initial concept of testing for bad breath, but then integrating it with the cell of the Aura Brush. And they put that out there, and then they start running ads to it because YouTube had just barely released its ad platform. Yeah. Um, and Jeffrey was buying up, I think, the majority of the <laughs> the majority of the inventory on YouTube for ads at that time because it was really cheap because they were just I mean, trying to get it. Oh, so now I think it's it's not really well, not you like widely used, right? Um, it is widely used, but like, um, it, it, I mean, compared to like almost, Facebook or, or well, Google. Well, well, yeah. When, when, well, when you talk, when you think of it in terms of like the innovators dilemma, right? That YouTube was at a point where they had to come in so cheap in order to compete with broadcasters and with yeah. TV and stuff in order to get people to justify even taking a chance on it. But that's right. what the game he's playing in. And it started to work. They started to be able to drive views and all of a sudden it was a thousand views of 10,000, a hundred thousand millions of views on this video. And then from that, they end up getting into 
they end up getting into Walmart, CVS, and Walgreens, and all these um, different um, retailers yeah. with the Aura Brush. And um, that was kind of the first foray into the video side of things. It's funny, he sent me a, I was in Chicago at the time, um, working at, um, um, at a design agency there as a writer. And um, he was sending me cuts of the video and saying, what do you think of this? And asking me like to consult on the script and things like that. And um, at the time I was like, man, this is a really long video. It's like over two minutes long. It's really, really long for an ad. He's like, well, did you watch the whole thing? I was like, well, yeah. Were you interested? Yeah. Were you ever bored? No, not really. He's like, okay, well then we're fine. <laughs> and um, yeah, just because no, I was thing is long copy or long video is just boring, right? Right. Just boring uh, stuff. Right? right. And then, I mean, ultimately like I was coming from the school thought of everything is 30 seconds or maybe it's 15 seconds or a minute or whatever it is, uh, whatever was set up for broadcast. But, um, but at any rate, that was very successful. Um, my brothers and I later resigned from Aura Brush in order to do, um, the Poopery campaign. Right. And, um, uh, the owner of Poopery had seen the success of Aura Brush and was like, man, I want that done for my brand. And um, we kind of jumped ship and went over there and um, basically did that all over again. And we're like, wow, there's, there's something really here. And at the time, there was no intention of starting an agency at How all. How did they find you at the time, Daniel? Because did you guys have... LinkedIn. You, you, a LinkedIn. So yeah, she, she, she LinkedIn stalked Jeffrey. Got yeah. it. Got yeah. it. Yeah, you didn't it's, have a name of the company at the time. We didn't have a name of the company. She just was sending him product and say, try this out. This is really cool. And I remember him giving me a bottle of it. Try this out. This stuff's really cool and everything. And he was, he was t uh, talking to my brother Neil about it one day. He just kind of pulls me aside. He's like, you know, I think I'm, I might leave Aura Brush. And um, I mean, they were co-founders of Aura Brush, right? Neil and, Neil and Jeffrey were. Um, and, but I think we're going to go to this poopery thing. I was like, what? Um, and, but then once I like kind of started experimenting with the product and stuff, I was like, Oh, this is really cool. And, um, yeah, we all, we all resigned, went over to that campaign and, and we needed a place to be able to put, um, basically the money for the campaign. We needed a business entity. And so this is kind of a middle of the night decision, like 12 o'clock at night. Right. What are we going to call this thing? And then, you know, let's just call it Harbor brothers. And if we, if we need to change it, we'll, we'll we will later, whatever, you know, and it just generic as crap. <laughs> and, and so, but that's, that's what ended up happening. And then once the poopery campaign went live and all of a sudden Huffington Post shared it and Adweek shared it and advertising age shared it. And then everyone was citing creative agency, Harbor brothers. We were like looking back and forth across it at each other. Um, we were, well, this is in my brother's kitchen, right? We launched the whole poopery campaign for my brother's kitchen. We're just looking back and forth at each other being like, are we an agency? I guess we're an agency. Uh, yeah, like we weren't even thinking of it in those terms. And um, because at the time, the thought was we would ultimately be joining Poopery the way we had Aura Brush. Um, but it turned out that business-wise, that wasn't really going to make sense for us. And so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of how Harmon Brothers was born, that we, it was almost in spite of itself. <laughs> what I love about the story is the initial payment that your brother got from Aura Brush, right? Oh yeah, so ultimately when Dr. Bob said, come you know, come market my Aura Brush for me, Jeffrey did a bunch of work for him and um, wasn't having what he felt like was a lot of success but was spending a lot of hours on it. And, um, and Dr. Bob was like, okay, I wanna pay you something for it. And Jeffrey was like, well, no, I, don't, well, I haven't made you any money. You don't need to pay me anything yet. And, um, but Dr. Bob felt really bad about it. He's like, well, here, let me, let me show you. Let me pay you this. And he goes outside and he's like, here, you can have my motorcycle. As payment. Was this I just picture dumb and dumber for some reason. <laughs> well, I don't know if it was that old, but <laughs> he's like, here, I'll give you my motorcycle's payment. I think part of it is Jeffrey didn't have a car at the time. And Dr. Bob was kind of sick of going and picking him up after school, right. after his college classes to come, come work with him at his house. And so it is probably some ulterior motives there, maybe a little bit. <laughs> But um, yeah, that was his first his first paycheck was this Honda motorbike that I think he might still have to this day. Yeah, it's it's a collector's item. Um, <laughs> so with Aura Brush, the at the time you guys came on staff to help run it and and became kind of like an in-house advertising staff. Yeah, so Je Jeffrey and Neil helped 
um, co-founded along with Dr. Bob after they had that initial success. Yeah. Um, and uh, Jeff- Jeffrey was um, chief marketing officer. Neil was um, chief of operations. And then they later, later recruited me in. They'd been kind of, I've been doing moonlighting work for them on the side in Chicago. Yeah. And then at the time when they finally had uh, made enough money that they to pull me in full time as an art director, I was in Wisconsin and they brought me over from there. And um, we started producing a ton of video content for Orbrush. In fact, that's how I learned to do video was we, we, I came up with this concept called um, Morgan the Orbrush Tongue which is this, you know, giant, this guy in this giant tongue suit running around having these little adventures. It's kind of vlog style, if you will, if you are familiar with that format on YouTube yeah. stuff. And, um, and we did that. We were releasing a video a week for almost two years straight. Wow. And we did over, wow. yeah, we did over a hundred videos and that's, that's how I learned video is just through the repetition of doing them. So you thought originally, so then you do poopery and you'd maybe do a similar type of collaboration, but it's yeah. a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, ultimately that was kind of the idea at the beginning. It was like, Oh, we're going to be joining this company. We're going to be running the marketing and whatnot. And then, um, you know, just sometimes things just don't work out business wise. Yeah. And, um, and so when it became clear that that was not our path at all, um, we, we instead, um, uh, went on to do um, some more client work and stuff. I mean, uh, Daniel, the, the part I love about that, this portion of the story is sometimes people think, wow, like Aura Brush, huge success, Poopery, huge success. And they think just money's going to rain and fall from the sky. But at the time, you guys were still, I think there was a part of the story where your brother starts to drive for Uber at the time. <laughs> yeah, so right? that was actually. Our CEO now, um, Benton, was driving for Uber. So he, as part of the Poopery campaign, he was uh, managing the ad spend and the analytics behind it. And um, so he had moved himself out. He was working for Deloitte out in um, Virginia, and he would moved him and his family out to come work on this Poopery campaign. And um, after Poopery, we had that, like, it was successful, the campaign was, but, like, financially for us, it wasn't necessarily terribly successful. Um, and so um, just kind of the hard knocks of learning business, right? When you're, when you're getting going and no, that's what I love about the story because people think, you know, oh, they've made it right. They've made exactly. Yeah. No, it was far it, from the truth. Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, it was great in that it got our name out there, right? It was, it was amazing in that regard and that it kind of put us on the map of like, Oh, they've actually done it twice now. Right. Mm-hmm. Or, or and you could even say three times because there have been Aura Brush. We released a product called Aura Pup that we had done it with, which was a, a bad breath um, brush for dogs. And then also now Poopery. And so we, we definitely had leads coming in. And we started, we didn't really have our business model figured out and everything back then. And we were just kind of flying by the seat of our pants trying to make ends meet. And yeah, for a while, like I was dipping clear into my savings account. I literally drained it almost to zero. Um, the same was happening with Benton and his family. And so he went out to drive Uber while, while I was working on some, um, uh, some video campaigns and stuff. And I mean, we were a little bit naive at the time where, um, even after Poopery, we did a video for, um, for our church, um, and, um, a foundation called the Radiant Foundation, which was this whole nativity of video about Jesus. We did it with the, as a collaboration with the piano guys. David Archuleta and, and Peter Hollins. And um, it was awesome, but we didn't do it for any profit. Like there, were, there was basically no profit at all. And so we're like, oh, we did this really cool thing for the world and for Jesus. So everything's just going to fall into place. <laughs> and sometimes it just doesn't work that way. You have to wait a little bit. <laughs> That's right. You have to wait a little bit more. And so it was just one thing after another where we had these little little kind of no name kind of cl- clients that we went through and did stuff for and it wasn't very profitable. We were trying to figure ourselves out. Um, and that was all leading up to when Bobby Edwards of Squatty Potty, the founder of Squatty Potty mm-hmm. uh, reached out to Jeffrey and he saw the poopery video and was like, man, I wish that that should have been my brand is what mm-hmm. he said. Mm-hmm. And he's like, okay, I really want to do a video with you guys. And um, the concept we came up with, was to use um, ice cream as a metaphor for poop. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, we thought, you know, his, the problem he came to us with is like, 
we so much want to get this on to like QVC and these kind of, um, you know, broadcasts. We want to, we, we want to sell it on TV, but it's just too gross to show it on TV. Was it, were they, so, did he come to you pre shark tank or after? He it was, was after shark tank. So they, shark tank. Okay. they had their initial shark tank boom yeah. and they were wanting to, um, sustain the growth. Right. They wanted to keep going. They didn't want to just fizzle out with that. Right. So he was, he was very right um, to be thinking of those terms. And Bobby's always been um, very visionary that way. Yeah. And so we were like, okay, what's, I mean, this is Jeffrey's thought process, right? What's like ice, well, no, what's like poop, but isn't, you know, <laughs> it was ice cream, <laughs> like the furthest thing from it. And then we started talking and like, okay, what would, you know, what would poop ice cream? And then basically the internet told us it had to be unicorns. <laughs> and this is, be, this is before. He called you at the time though, right? At the, at the time he was asking your advice. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this was, um, are, are you saying Jeffrey was asking my advice? Yeah. About, oh, yeah. Specific, I think you guys were brainstorming. This. Yes. We were brainstorming this together. Well, he'd come up with this, this like metaphor of ice cream. Right. And then right. we, is that a machine? Is that like a mechanical machine? Like, no, it's got to be like an animal. What if it's a, what if it's a unicorn? And then ultimately like, what does that ice cream look like? And all these different things that we threw around and the initial concepts were, were pretty downright terrible and that we had like this giant Clydesdale unicorn <laughs> that would have been terrifying. Um, <laughs> and, it, and it was like on a food truck in the middle of like a big city. Right. And yeah. it was all these weird things and it didn't end up being that. Thankfully we got another, writer involved besides me and Jeffrey, um, Dave Vance, um, who really came with the main, um, I guess, contextual concept of integrating it into a mythical world with a prince. Right. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, now a unicorn actually makes sense, right? If we're going to, if we're going to buy into this, let's really lean into this world in a real way. It's this prince pitching it. And, um, in all honesty, like they, Bobby was sold on us. And he, and he had initially wanted to go with this, but then decided not to because he had investors that were pushing back on him and mm. went and tried a different thing. It didn't work out. And they came back to us about three to four months later and said, yeah, let's just go, let's just go for it. Let's have you guys figure it out. And when we were sitting down with them to write the script, they didn't get it until, especially Bobby's parents, um, Bill and Judy did not get it until this prince was in there. And um, this, you do, you were in this mythical world, and all of a sudden they're like, "Okay, I see how this can work," and that was um, like a really big moment um, for us is to have that breakthrough. Yeah, and um, and then ultimately, like you know, that's a little bit terrifying to put your brand on the back of a, of a as, as Bobby would say, the crazy wackadoodle unicorn. <laughs> but he went for it, and and it just paid off in a huge way. I mean. Everyone, I, I suggest anyone go watch all of your ads, specifically, you know, the Squatty Potty ad. It, it's still, I hate you in a sense, Daniel, because part of that, info, the, the video is burned into my mind as <laughs> there's a, they're not on the Squatty Potty and there's a little bit of that rainbow ice cream left in the unicorn and you're like, yeah, me right now when I'm not using the Squatty Potty. Yeah, no, exactly. It's So it's part of me hates you cool. now because that is that is stamped into my brain. Um, it, it's really hard to use public restrooms after you've used a squatty potty. <laughs> so you're like, I'm missing the experience. <laughs> <laughs> what was, so squatty potty, um, you also, and again, everyone should check out from poop to gold um, because you guys really do a good job breaking down. Um, it's not like you just come up with the first version, you launch it, it goes viral. You do a lot of testing, even a lot of iterations. But then, when you have that iterate, you know the the final cut or what could be the final cut, you go out and you test it. Yes. Um, talk about that process. I don't think ever, everyone realizes not only do you test it, but then you actually put distribution dollars behind it too. So. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I think um, the best filmmakers. Maybe this is a little too broad a statement. I, I think. It can be a really good policy as a filmmaker or as a comedian to adopt a lot of the same mentality as an entrepreneur does. Where an entrepreneur goes goes out with an idea and a product and tests it on a market and then adjusts it, right? Yeah. And essentially, that's the way we approach our advertising. That as we make an edit, we show it to people. If they're not laughing and we can see consistently, this is not getting laughed. Let's cut that joke out. It's just it's it's not helping. Let's get it out of there, right? Um, or this part is confusing them. We've got to tweak something here to make that right. 
And, um, and so that's the process we go through kind of internally to come up with um, an ad that we're going to go out and then test in the real world, right? And we, it's, it's much better to embarrass yourself in front of a few little people than it is to, in front of millions of people online. And so if you can get into that iterative process with your video of not being too precious about your work and showing it to other people and testing, then that's, that's a really great way to come up with some of the best quality. And then ultimately, we, we start with our guts, but then you want to test your way into what's actually working. And so we'll test things like the title of the video. Um, the title for the poopery video, for example, came from a comment hmm. of one of the original YouTube commenters said, girls don't poop. And we're like, oh, well, that's kind of cool. Let's just throw that in as a title. And it hmm. tested extremely well, right? It was like 10 or 20% better than anything else that we could come up with ourselves. Yeah. Um, but it's the same way where um, we'll test all sorts of different titles, maybe test them against each other, um, all sorts of different thumbnails. So the image that you see on your video, um, the very first image you yeah. see as well as like we'll test the content itself. What are those first, first few seconds that are gonna pull people in? How's that holding people over? We can test all that um, YouTube, Facebook, they all provide really robust tools for being able to analyze that data and find out what works with your audiences. And um, I mean, we always say make it good enough that it doesn't have to be viral. And we feel like that really is the key to it, that if you, are making a piece that's so strong that you know when you spend behind it you can predictably get money back um then all of a sudden the views are going to come along for the ride right i mean so much of what what we do is we're kind of riding the middle ground of what the advertising world knows because on the one extreme you have direct response right and it's known for brands like snap um like slap chop and sham wow and so no, and pull peel. Wait, there's more. Yeah, yeah, there's, exactly. Other brands that start with S, <laughs> um, and they're very. They can be very effective at driving sales immediately, right? But then on the ex the other extreme polar opposite end, you have brands like Nike, Red Bull, Apple, Ford, and stuff that are doing just very heavy branding, right? And they're not looking for direct response on that um, as much as they have the money to put it out there in front of all the eyeballs in the world and eventually that's going to come back to him. Right. So it's, it's more of a long-term investment kind of thing, but for businesses starting out that you can't afford to do that. You can't afford to spend that kind of money. And so we said, what, what, what if you marry the best of both worlds and you have both the direct response that sells really well, and then you can marry the really great branding. And that's where our comedy and our branding and stuff comes in. And so that when people don't buy a squatty potty, but they watched and laughed at the ad. Then as they're walking through Target or Walgreens or something like, Hey, there's a squatty potty right there. Should we pick one up? Yeah, let's give it a try. That kind of a thing, you know? Um, and so that's, that's what we do with, with our, our Harvard brothers campaigns. We live kind of in that, in that middle ground of mixing the best of both worlds and not having to necessarily have the stigmas around, you know, direct response and infomercials mm -hmm. and not also necessarily having to have the, you know, the mega brand or the billions of dollar budget or whatever to, in order to get your name out there, like Verizon has to or something. Yeah. And specifically, I mean, you, there's a lot of things you test and um, one of them, I mean, obviously, you know, combining the branding and direct response is you you talk about this over and over is you need to have a call to action, right? Yes. What are some of the calls to action that you guys have created or tested? Maybe you switch them one wasn't working and you switched to what was, or just in general, what, what's been working for some of the, the videos you put out there? Yeah, you bet. Um, I mean, we kind of have a, a harmonism with our calls to action at this point where we say, so if, and then we give kind of a, um, a blanket statement that kind of captures everybody, you know, if you're a human being, you that, poop, you should yeah, be yeah, exactly. Like if your poo stinks is the poopery one, uh -huh, then click here to order your poopery today. And um, uh, it's, yeah, I mean, I think the same thing with Squatty Potty is, um, well, well, on purple, it's, so if you or someone you know sleeps, you know, <laughs> it's like obviously everybody sleeps, then we, you can do this. So th those are some of the things that we've done, and it's not to say people need to get stuck in that at all. Um, that's kind of just been our own like signature style on it. But um, 
the calls to action. Like the potpourri, for instance, like I think you did a free tester or something that worked. Yeah. What was, yeah, what were some of the offers? The, the more direct you can be with people, I think when it comes to the call to action, if they stuck around that long in your video, it's okay to speak with them very directly about buying it. You don't have to get overly clever. You don't have to feel like you have to be funny. In fact, in, fact, in many ways, that can often be a distraction um, from the sale. And so you want to be careful of that. Um, but yeah, so Pooperies, um, when Aura Brush had a similar um, type of thing that worked for a long time, which was you can get um, your, your Pooperie for free, just pay for shipping and handling. It's the same thing for Aura Brush, get an Aura Brush free, uh, uh, pay for shipping and handling, that kind of an offer. Um, like uh, Purples was uh, that they provided free shipping and a 100-night um, um, guarantee. And so there's all sorts of ways to kind of um, remind people that like, yeah, it's time to become a buyer. But you, if people are sticking around your ad, they expect you to ask them to buy. In fact, I feel like if, if you just kind of leave it empty hand and, and open-ended, then you're kind of doing um, the customer a disservice. Totally. Yeah. Um, so much to go over so little time. I have one last question for Jen. I mean, like you just, I've, everyone, I encourage anyone to get the book from poop to gold. Um, for one, they also have a Harmon brothers university. I think it's, it's a Harmon brothers university.com where people can check out. Yeah. Harmon brothers university.com has a course on there on how to write ads that sell, which is the first course we came out with. Um, and that one has, um, uh, th that one's an application process and there's only so many people we let in the time. Um, but, um, that, that one's a really good resource. If you're wanting to learn to just how to make your ads funny, we have Harmon brothers, university.com slash comedy. Um, and that one will, uh, take you to our comedy course, yeah. which is, um, a really, uh, kind of a, a fun thing that we're, uh, that we're really excited about. And there's a really good YouTube video from you guys too on how to be funny, I think. So people should check that one out. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, the, uh, from poop to gold, our, our book it's on harborbrothersbook.com. Yeah. Um, that's, that's available there. I think there's, it's got a special offer for like $20 or if you want to get it on Amazon, it's 30. Yeah. And from poop to gold podcast, um, check it out. Last question. You need to get from Poop the Gold book. I mean, it, it, it documents yeah. your guys' viewpoint in Fiberfix, chapbooks, Camp Shout, all these, and there's some great stories behind it. Um, last question is, you know, since Inspired Insider always ask, low moment and high moment, proud moment. Yeah. What's been um, kind of a low moment? What's been a especially proud moment for you? Yeah. Gosh, I'd say one of the low moments for us was definitely coming out of doing that nativity video where we were at a point of real frustration where, like I said, I drained almost my entire savings account in order to be able to kind of make this business, <laughs> make this business yeah. work. Um, Benton was driving Uber, um, our CEO, <laughs> and um, it, it, we just didn't really see the end in sight. We've had the success now with... Um, with poopery and stuff. And we just weren't seeing it, like you said, financially. And, um, we didn't have our business model, um, nailed down. And that was, that was really tough. It was really kind of a dark moment. And I know a lot of people, like you said, kind of look at us and be like overnight success and all this kind of stuff. And, and they forget, like we had some real hard times where we were just trying to make ends meet by doing just little one-off little videos that you've never even heard anything about. We hadn't figured our stuff out. And, and then, um, like what turned, um, I mean, ultimately we call it our poop to gold moment, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like truly. It turned a really crappy situation into a good one is that Squatty Potty came along, right? And we were able to um, do a deal that made sense for both parties. And it was a just, just a tremendous success that launched us and finally, I think, um, cemented us in people's mind, minds as um, kind of authorities in this space. And then that's when um, the leads really started coming in a way where we did purple and fiber fix chat books and so on. Yeah. I mean, I, Daniel, thank you. I appreciate your time. Um, I can't speak highly enough about from poop to gold. Even if you're, you don't care about ads and marketing, there's really good stuff on how you incentivize um, staff to be on yeah. the same page and make it a win-win. It's all, it's all those things on running a company. So I encourage everyone to get the book, check out, 
you know, we'll, we'll post all some of the um, link all of the year, embed the, uh, some of the uh, videos you guys have done on this, but I just want to be the first one to thank, you know, say thank you, go to harmbrothers.com, check all their stuff out. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you so much, Jeremy. It's fun being on. Yeah. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.